Now, we will begin our plenary session. Today, Professor Emilia Bruna will share with us a presentation titled, Is there really such a thing as tropical biology? Professor Emilio Bruna is a distinguished teaching scholar and professor of ecology and Latin American studies at the University of Florida. His research focuses on the effects on deforestation and habitat fragmentation in the tropics on a plant demography and plant-animal interactions and also on the structure of scientific institutions and collaborative networks. Please welcome Emilia to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Is this okay from the mic? Sometimes this mic the pickup is really high, so I blow out the people in the front and the people, great. So thanks a lot for coming out. Uh, I, I realize it's early. Um, and I want to start by thanking the organizing committee, which has been working for about 45 years to put this conference together. Um, it's, it's been really remarkable. It's wonderful to be back. Um, you know, it's like riding a bike. And it's just, it's just been a great, great, great time. And I'm grateful for both all the work you put into it and for the opportunity to speak to you today about this subject that is so near and dear to all of our hearts. Ordinarily, I would be on stage ranting about the state of plant demography in our field and the lack of comprehensive demographic data collection for most species in the tropics. If you want me to rant about that, I'd be happy to do it afterwards outside. Um, instead, I'm going to be ranting about something else. Um, but because this talk is you know, quasi-historical in its um, focus, I thought it might be useful to kind of give my own acknowledgments at the beginning, like Liza does. I like to do mine at the beginning as well. But in this case, focus a little bit on the people that have helped me along my history. And I'm reminded by seeing a couple of people take pictures that as soon as this talk is over, I'll be pushing both the talk to GitHub. Um, I'll put the repository link back up there so you'll be able to download not only the talk itself, the slides, but also all the code that went into making the figures, the data that was used for making them, as well as a Zotero reading list with um, all the PDFs of all the articles that both went into getting this presentation together and that are cited in the presentation as well. So you have access to all the materials that went into this and um, I'll put the address up there to make sure that you can get it afterwards. So um, first and foremost, my parents who literally, you know, I mean, they've been you know, carrying me since day one, but, um, but there are a couple of people here in particular, I think, um, that I need to thank. Frank Joyce, for those of you from Costa Rica who've had any involvement in, in biology in Costa Rica. Frank Joyce is just this towering figure. My advisors for my PhD, Susan Harrison and Sharon Strauss. Um, John Cress actually both took me to Brazil and took me to my first ATBC meeting. So he was really the person who set me on this path. And of course, the collaborators that have um, made my professional career um, such a just a great experience. Eraldo Vasconcelos, Mario Uriarte, Brian Inouye, um, the Materos that we worked with, um, Ellen Andresen, who helped me throughout in the field, and of course, all the people that I've become close to at the university and elsewhere. Um, I couldn't possibly have named all the students that helped. So Priyanka here is this representing all the students that I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with. And I feel like these days all I do is chase the amazing researchers um, that are on the rise. And so Miguel Acevedo represents that group of people. Um, coming to these meetings is just wonderful because I realized just what an amazing future this field has, assuming it exists. Um, um, and then finally, the ATBC family, and of course, the, the inspiration for White is that we do what we do. So I'd like to begin in kind of an unusual way, first with the acknowledgments, and second with some caveats right away instead of saving them for the end. 
The first is that this is not designed to be a comprehensive historical overview. Um, there are exceptional works on the history of tropical exploration and tropical sciences, the Foundations of Tropical Forest Biology book edited, um, co-edited by Robin Chasden has a really, really great introduction to the he history of um, early exploration. I love the book Picturing Tropical Nature um, about uh, perceptions and images of, of the tropics, um, the invention of nature, about von Humboldt. There's really phenomenal literature out there. And the second thing is this is actually a uh, talk about a topic that we've been wrestling with for decades, if not centuries. Um, there's a couple of reviews here that have been really important. Th this talk is really a play on a talk on a paper by Michael Robinson called Is Tropical Biology Real? There's The Future of Tropical um, Ecology by Dan Jansen, which is an amazing paper, by the way. It's in the Annual Review of Ecology and Systematics. And Dan, I hope you're watching Dan, Dan doesn't actually review or cite any other papers in his annual review. It's unreal. It's just him full on Dan. So it's a great read. Absolutely go for it. And so um, the third thing I'm going to do that's a bit unusual is I'm actually going to answer the question first and then work my way backwards through the logic. And so is there really such a thing as tropical biology? And the answer to that is no, maybe, and yes. Okay, and so I'm gonna carry you through each of these parts here. And let's start with the first one. So the first thing is no, there is no such thing as tropical biology. And the motivation really for this talk and what has gotten me thinking about this so much is a decision letter that I got not too long ago that I think most people in this room are probably familiar with. You've probably gotten a text something like this, which is, the scope of your paper makes it more appropriate for a specialized journal focusing on tropical systems. Just out of curiosity, has anybody else in this room gotten that decision letter? Something along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. And so this, this really made me think because it's, it's that word specialized, right? It's the, the, the specialization there. It's something about that adjective in front of the word biology, right? That implies that we are somehow a specialization, um, something narrower, right? So we're, we're not biology, we're tropical biology. And what that really implies, I think, is one of three things. Either that, you know, things are specialized subdisciplines because of the approach or the tools that they use, right? So, if, you know, you might use a particular approach or tools in a way that crosses systems and conceptual domains, and that's why you're nested within this kind of broader sphere of biology. And so, you know, there are academic societies that are structured that way, right? So as an a member of the ATBC, someone who's active here, I think in you know, societies as useful organizations focusing on particular interests to the scientific community. So here you might have mathematical biology or cell biology or experimental biology, in vitro biology, right? Those are all adjectives that tell you something about the specialization of approaches and tools, even if it crosses conceptual domains. So another approach might be to organize your academic societies, your organizations around conceptual domains that instead cross systems and approaches, right? And these different conceptual domains all tell you something about the way in which biology operates. And so this could be something like the Society for Conservation Biology, right? Or systematic biology, ethnobiology, or evolutionary biology, right? So you can do evolutionary biology in lots of different systems and using lots of different tools. It's the conceptual organizing focus of evolution by natural selection that gets you um, a, to be a member of that society because you have something in common with people who have that similar conceptual focus. And then the third thing, of course, could be that you're specialized because you work on a particular study system and the people working on that study system might approach it in different conceptual ways or using different tools, but they're all interested in that system. And that could be either a taxonomic system, right? Avian biology, fish biology, um, masto, uh, mastozoologia. Um, it could be plant biology. It, it could, in theory, be something that's kind of geological or geographic, so there, there's a society for island biology, there's an international mountain society which focuses a lot on the biology of mountain ecosystems. And it could be biogeographic, which gets a little closer to, I think, what people think about when they're talking about tropical biology, right? There are a couple of national grassland um, societies, but there's not really much in the way of scholarly organizations, scholarly societies like ours that are focused on biogeographic regions 
or biomes, right? If you think about it, you know, there, there was a Mediterranean biologist society. It's kind of gone defunct. There's no, there is an early career scholars in polar biology, but there's no, you know, there's no tundra biology society, right? There are some journals that focus on these things, but, but it's not enough to bring people from around the world together into one place. Think about things. Tropical biology defies all of these specialization guidelines. It is cross-conceptual, cross-tool, cross-system. It, it doesn't fit neatly into any of these things. And so if we are indeed a specialization, right, if that adjective is doing its job, then what that implies is that we must be some other kind of specialization because we don't fit into any of these that I um, and others have kind of put together before. But perhaps the best evidence that there really isn't such a thing, a unifying thing as tropical biology, is that if you're a graduate of a university, say, Del Rosario, your, your degree is in biology, right? So here we are in a tropical country where all the biology is tropical, but the degree you get is not in tropical biology, it's in biology. And I know that because I went and looked, and this is what you would take in your eight semesters as a student at the university here. And while apparently they undermined a little of my talk by developing a course in tropical biology not too long ago, thanks a lot for that. It's not a requirement, right? It's an elective. In other words, here we are studying in, as you know, they'll tell you incessantly if you get them started, one of the most biodiversity rich countries in the world, second or third, depending on the group, and they'll tell you it's second. And yet tropical biology appears nowhere on what a biology student is required to study when they're here, right? In Colombia, they just call biology, right? And it's that way in most tropical countries as well. And for what it's worth, it's not just the students, it's also the animals, none of whom care anything about arriving at the 23rd parallel and stopping, right? Tropical species um, are found in southern Arizona uh, in the United States. They're found far in, towards the southern cone. There are lots of you know, animal species that spend part of the year up there and part of the year down here. And so Conceptually, it doesn't align well. It doesn't really align well biologically because you know, there are very few species that sit there and then stop. And frankly, even we can't seem to get our act together. Uh, Feely and Stroud had a really interesting paper in which they reviewed a ton of literature in tropical biology to try to see how tropical biologists define the tropics. And they came up with eight, eight different definitions for how tropical biologists conceptualize what it is we do. We can't even agree on it. Um, so the notion that we're gonna put this in the hands of someone else to decide what it is. And so the, the reason, I mean, you're probably aware, um, you've certainly seen it coming here, is that this idea of the tropics, and I mean in the broad sense, right? Not in the sense of between the 23rd, I mean, the tropics has a very clear definition. It's, it's the points on Earth that are exposed to directly overhead solar radiation for at least one day per year. That's what it means to be in the tropics, right? And that's why it ends at that 23rd parallel north and south. But if we speak in the more broad sense, since a lot of the tropics as a distinct and unique entity is really a historical artifact that traces its origins back to Marco Polo. Now Marco Polo was not the first person to head towards the tropics in search of ginger and pepper and um, cinnamon and nutmeg but he was the first person who told their stories about his trip to someone else who wrote them down. And it was, I mean, it was viral before viral existed, right? So the, the, the tales of Marco Polo um, were spread like wildfire throughout Europe and inspired all kinds of stories and ideas about what it was like in these distant and exotic lands, right? And ultimately, um, what you saw over the next several centuries was the creation of you know, several different paradigms about what the tropics were. The tropics were either a paradise, right? Sir Walter Raleigh said that if there's anywhere on earth that's as close as there is to the Garden of Eden, it's in the tropics, right? And you see this in both the written word, you might see it in artistic works, like this painting by Albert Ecuto, who was a Dutch painter in Brazil in the late 1600s. Um, the alternative, of course, is that the tropics were hell on earth, right? There were hellscapes, they're full of disease and dangerous people, they, you know, uh, they were the source of madness. Um, you know, recent politicians, at least in the United States where I live, refer to tropical countries in really derogatory ways, in part because this is one of the narratives that they've been hearing for centuries about the tropics, right? Um, not just about the 
the conditions there, but the people that live in the tropics as well. I mean, Marco Polo wrote some really beautiful things about some tropical people, and then he wrote some really awful things about others. And then the third thing that you see is that the tropics, in part because of these other two things, are, are destinations for self-discovery, as well as discovery, in quotes, right, of a lot of these natural resources, and about proving oneself. Right? That's why people go to the tropics, because either they have this insatiable drive they can't understand, like von Humboldt, who was just driven and just had to go all the time, or you had daddy issues like Darwin did, and the way you proved yourself was by going to the tropics, or you were Teddy Roosevelt who was frustrated because his political party didn't nominate him to run for president, so the way he dealt with that and got that out of his system was calling up then Colonel, now later Marshal Rondon, and deciding to explore this tributary in the Amazon that he thought that would be just a really cool way to get over his massive disappointment and not having leadership of the country handed to him. And so what you get is the, the tropics visited by early Europeans. They come back with narratives about these tropics which are consumed by the public and transformed by the public, then shared again in new narratives and ultimately what you end up is then multiple different versions of what the tropics are. And this happened repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. And it's happened for centuries and centuries and centuries to the point where you see these tropes repeated in high art, in low art, in every aspect of our lives. You can trace through these different tropes back to the original writings of people like Sir Walter Raleigh or um, early Franciscans working through the Americas. I mean, if, if you were to go through high art, it would be Gauguin or Rudyard Kipling, um, you know, and Fitzcarraldo. That's all about proving yourself, right? If you wanted to instead, you know, Tarzan, Eat, Pray, Love, um, you know, Anaconda. This is, for me, talk about mixed metaphors, this is Dolce & Gabbana's 2020 collection, and it's women wild in the jungle like modern nymphs. So we're taking Greek mythology and mixing it with like generic jungle stuff with a nice smattering of colonialism in there. It's, it's just wild, right? And this is this generic interpretation of what the tropics are. In fact, the historian David Arnold has said that calling a part of the globe the tropics became a Western way of defining something environmentally and culturally distinct from Europe but also perceiving a high degree of common identity, perceiving a high degree of common identity between the constituent regions of the tropical world. In other words, it's a way of setting the tropics apart as other, while also smoothing over any differences, right? It makes it easier to separate something as distinct when you ignore all the differences that there are within that region that you're considering different from yourself. And so you end up, over the centuries of this work, reinforcing and manipulating and twisting uh, ideas about what the tropics are with this kind of platonic ideal of what a tropical field site is. And the fact is that this slide has been up for 30 seconds and everybody looks at it and goes, yeah, this looks like, uh, they're trying to figure out where exactly is this place because it looks like an awesome place to go and do some botanizing. And I think maybe there's one person in the room who realizes that this isn't actually a tropical field site. This is Pandora's world of Avatar and Disney World. And the reason it looks like so many of the places we work is because that's what Pandora is, right? Uh, Avatar is really just Fern Gully, the last rainforest in space. This is what they think exotic, distant destinations look like. They look like the tropics. They look like the places we work because that's what explorers do. They go to jungles. And so the tropics as other and unique became this kind of paradigm for the way we approach the world. And um, scientifically then that was translated into the biology of the tropics is unique. And these same cultural reinforcements about what the tropics were, were absorbed by academics in Europe and in the United States um, who had these ideas in mind when they were formalizing the field of ecology and the field of evolutionary biology, which sets us today. If you have not read this book by Megan Rabbi, American Tropics, it's a, just a great, great read. She's a historian at UT Austin um, who wrote about the Caribbean roots of biodiversity science and how um, researchers in the United States who were interested in studying biodiversity and understanding why, you know, the origins of biodiversity then looked to the tropics and decided to establish places in the tropics where they could go do their research and come back. And um, it's worth a read, so I'll just use one pull quote from it, which I think is really great, which is that um, she writes, our field is a colonial science 
visiting researchers from the United States encountered Panamanians as cooks or mechanics writing about um, what became the Smithsonian, uh, about, about BCI, um, as cooks or mechanics, but rarely as fellow academics. Now, I will tell you this, this is not the case in all of the field stations, and this is one of the things that's really interesting, is the different ways in which field stations in the tropics operated in different ways in relationship to both local scientists and the scientists that were coming from abroad. And so you have this perception of the tropics as different and exotic and novel and away, right, remote. They were distant, coupled with um, going and leaving and not interacting with anybody actually in the tropics when you were there, and things like the broader geographical notions of what the world was operating in under. You know, this is a typical Mercator projection. I've seen several of these in presentations here already in the last couple of days. And inside of that is the actual area of countries that are represented there, right? And this is com you know, common among geographers who will tell you that the way we see countries in the typical Mercator projections that a lot of us grew up with reinforced notions of, you know, what countries are big and which ones are small, and that translates in many ways indirectly, coupled with this imagery about both the places and the people who live there. And so what you ended up constructing was this notion that the biology of the tropics is unique, and that means that the tropics are a part and they can inform our understanding of biology. I've got a stack of articles over there in my backpack from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, mostly with variants around the title of what the tropics can teach us about biology, right? The tropics are apart, there's a biological foundation, which is really a temperate foundation, and tropical biology is helping to fine-tune our understanding of biological systems. This is what it means for tropical biology to be specialized. There's biology, and then there's tropical biology, which can tell us a little bit about how most biological systems operate. And of course, this is, you know, absurd on its face. Uh, within the tropics, uh, explicitly defined, right? You have majority of biodiversity. You have roughly 40% of the terrestrial land area. It's not a specialization, it's nearly half. Um, on the bottom left, you'll see um, human population by latitude. Currently within the tropics, you have about 43% of the human population, just a little more if you're willing to go up to about 25 degrees latitude. But by 2025, it's predicted that exactly half the people in the world will be in the tropics. And there on the bottom right is also the emergence of global megacities of over 10 million people, a lot of which um, will be emerging in the tropics as well, right? So it's not that the tropics are other and smaller and narrower and unique. The tropics are actually the foundation, right? This is the baseline. This is where most of the biology is happening. It's where most of the action is. It's where at least half the people are. Um, and so it's a really useful thought exercise to think about what it would have been like if people's understanding of geography and biology had been just a little bit different, if the people who had been setting up the development of our field uh, might have had kind of a more global perspective initially. I think, for instance, this is something that once you, once you realize it, you'll start to notice it everywhere. What you'll see here is that the people working in the other places, right, the tropics, the specialized, include those adjectives in the definitions or in the titles of their articles more often, even, even in the highest profile journals, right, which are presumably catering to a broader audience using very broad general underlying principles, right? So Wojtek and colleagues in this article is why are there so many species of herbivorous insects in tropical rainforests? We'll get to the formulation of that question in the first place. But in tropical rainforests, whereas um, Seaman and colleagues here uh, working in an old field in Minnesota, right? Insect species diversity, abundance, and body size relationships, but there's no geography there, right? There's no adjectives. And so, you know, in theory, if we'd started from the opposite direction, what you would have seen is that the title of this paper would be why there are so many species of herbivorous insects, and this one would be insect species diversity and abundance body size relationships in a North American grassland. But keep an eye out. You'll start to notice this, right? You'll notice this is something at least the postdoc in my lab from Brazil, um, Nina Chias, pointed out immediately. She said, we're taught to do this. But when I came here to the United States, I was really impressed that nobody here does this. And you can, you know, you can have fun with this if you go backwards and look, you might see that 
um, maybe George Stevens, instead of saying the latitudinal gradient and geographic range, how so many species coexist in the tropics, you know, the, the title of this paper might have been, um, you know, the latitudinal gradient geographic range, why are there so few species in the temperate zone, right? It's all about the framing. Um, Bob Payne, food web complexity and species diversity, super broad, no geography. I mean, let's face it, this is a cool paper, foundational paper, really important to our field, but it probably might have better been titled Surprisingly Strong Effects of Predatory Starfish on the Modern Diversity Food Webs of North American Tide Pools. Not as catchy a title, maybe wouldn't have made it into AMNAT, right? Now, if you've heard this before, and I am sure some people have, it's because you probably maybe read this paper from an address to the Panama Conference on Tropical Biology in 1966 by Ripley, who wrote, we in the United States are inevitably a temperate zone-oriented people. Uh, I'll save you the trouble of reading it all, which is, as a result, in the case of biology, a major part of the accumulated biological, biological knowledge is concerned with a rather minor part of the world fauna and flora because of the chance development of biology in the temperate zones. This is an old story, we know this, but we keep forgetting it and relearning it and forgetting it and relearning it, and we certainly don't reshape this paradigm. The fact is, I'm, I mean, I am not advocating. I love that word, as you'll see in a moment. I think it's actually really important. Remember, there's a maybe and a yes coming. But this adjective um, perhaps reinforces the idea that there's biology and the others, and in fact, maybe we should be working with our poor unfortunate colleagues who have to work in other places to help them come up with the Association for Temperate Biology and Conservation. Um, because maybe this is the specialized organization that um, is missing out there that I was looking for. So is there really such a thing as tropical biology? And I, I, there really isn't, right? If you think about it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, as a unifying conceptual focus, we transcend disciplines, tools, we, tra uh, you know, we organisms that we study, and really it's a historical artifact that's the result of the way in which the history of this world via colonialism operated. That's why we think of the tropics the way we do, right? It's not the tropics per se um, being clearly defined as distinct, it's because they were formulated as distinct and we were told they were distinct for a really long time. On the other hand, there is one way that they could be distinct, and that is that if we're, you know, it could be that even if they don't exist as a unique entity, the things that we choose to study when we work in this part of the world, maybe they are different from the things that we chose to study in another part of the world. In other words, that the topics that we study in the tropics and outside of the tropics either overlap completely, in which case they truly aren't different, or, or maybe they don't overlap at all, in which case the tropics are indeed distinct. So I won't be showing you a lot of details about this. It's actually a much, it's a small slice of a much broader piece of work, but it's a kind of a broader text analysis that looks at what we're studying as biologists working in the tropics. And to do this, I um, did some text analysis of about 62,000 articles published between 1960 and 2022. I chose these journals for starters for a couple of reasons. I'll talk to you about it afterwards if you're interested, but they're the ones that you can find in the Web of Science or in Scopus, which are the places where you can download the most data. So there had to be overlap in the journals that were found there. If you want to know about all the details about why it's complicated to do this kind of bibliometric work and the gaps in um, and what's available in the different databases and things like that, I'm happy to do so afterwards. But what it breaks down as is the first part, I'll show, um, I mean, I will show you some analysis of titles, just to keep it easy, um, uh, with the full 62,000 or so. And then I'm gonna show you the analysis of the keywords with about 30,000 of the articles, somewhere in the neighborhood of 220,000 keywords over the course of this study. And again, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the kind of technical stuff which is easy to get bogged down in and actually could get kind of boring, but I'm happy to answer questions about it afterwards. I will say that um, even though the, the, there are some real and very sophisticated analyses you can do with this, I'm gonna show, um, I'm gonna kind of bypass and gloss over just how sophisticated some of these are and actually show you um, some really simple stuff and not in an overly creative way, okay? Just to kind of get the point out. This is really the art of proving the obvious, so that's why I'm doing it that way. So the first thing is that actually, if you do some cluster analysis, it's called this topic modeling, LDA cluster analysis, you do actually find that these journals cluster out in different ways, so the, conservation, the, the tropically focused journals all actually do cluster together. That's reassuring, maybe there is actually something to this. You have a second cluster, which is the Journal of Ecology, Journal of Animal Ecology, and the American Naturalist. Ecology is off on its own in another corner, and evolution is off on its own in another corner. I would have expected evolution in American Naturalist maybe to have a little more overlap than there did. 
Um, I can explain how this LDA works later, but this is basically kind of one way in which this corpus of literature clusters. The other way is to simply look at the keywords, identify the journals as either tropical or global, for lack of a better term. Remember in these global journals, there are articles about the tropics, right? And I will not be separating them out because it turns out they overlap really neatly and I'll show you how it works. Um, so instead what we can do is just compare tropical journals, global journals, and look at their keywords. Overall, by the way, these are the top keywords um, that came out of this. So on the left there in gray is the keywords by journal. There's obviously, because some of these journals publish a lot more papers, you're gonna have a lot more keywords there, so they're gonna be dominated. That's why this overall list may not be really useful. What it reflects is the journals that have published the most papers rather than anything else, but it's a useful list to get us started. You'll notice at the very top there you have species diversity, biodiversity, go figure, ecologists and evolutionary biologists are really interested in all these species and where they came from. So here we have the top keywords for the global journals, competition, species diversity, climate change, herbivory, sexual selection, dispersal, et cetera. I'm gonna put up the list for the tropical ones, and I'm curious to see if anybody has any impressions that pop out at them. Feel free to yell out anything if you, you, know, you wanna be the first one. I have ATB6, ATBC stickers that I have to give away, otherwise I have to take them home. First person to yell out an observation gets an ATBC sticker, okay? Anything stand out? Okay, so tropical, that doesn't get you a sticker. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you see on the left-hand side? You see conceptual. On the right, you see location. You see place. So in the keywords, right, which are helping people identify what kind of literature is out there for you to address, the global journals really emphasize those theoretical issues that are being addressed. The tropical literature overwhelmingly is tied to place. I'm not making a value judgment about that at all. I'm simply noting it as a difference at this point, okay? By the way, if you were to go to 21, 22, and 23, those are countries as well, yeah. This is the only overlap there is in the top 20 keywords between those two. So it's, to me, remarkable. In part, it's not a surprise that species diversity is the first one. Um, but how little overlap there is in the conceptual issues. Not the specific issues, but just how little overlap there is, for what it's worth, the topics that are being covered tracks with what's been observed by others who have looked at kind of the conceptual evolution of ecology and evolutionary biology as fields, okay? So here it is for keywords. For keywords we have, um, I mean for the title words, and these are called bigrams because it, it goes through every possible sequence of, simul of consecutive words and pulls them out and then goes through every one and pulls them out. So life history, population dynamics, sexual selection, body side, Drosophila melanogaster, that's the first system that appears anywhere in any of the topical or keyword analyses for the ecology and evolution journals. And then over there on the right again, Costa Rica, rainforest, tropical forest, tree species, tropical rain, that's the first half of a trigram it's called, or three gram, tropical rainforest. Right? So again, we see this being tied to place. The problem is, you could argue that this is because we're studying different things, right? So there really is a difference in what we're studying. But there's a bit of a problem of a kind of a toucan and the egg here, which is this, right? It could be because there's an interest in studying different things, but it could be because when you either are either preparing an article, you're looking at your research, you think, I have to write this up for one of the tropical journals, it's gotta be really focused on place, or this won't get into one of the general journals because it's not written up in a very general, broad way, even if the research is applicable. It's difficult to separate what we've been taught to think about how to write up research and what research editors have been taught to think is acceptable for their field from the actual interest in studying this thing. But one of the things we know about biases in research is in fact that there are these biases based on who's in charge and what people are studying about what they think is most relevant. So I'm gonna leave this as a maybe for now, although I'm pretty sure it's not a maybe. And then finally, the problem is I think that we've been focusing almost entirely on biology in trying to address this question. I mean, what makes the tropics truly unique and distinct is not actually um, the biology. 
think it's really the context in which that biology is done, which is something that all of these previous attempts to address whether or not tropical biology is really a thing have seemingly ignored, right? Um, tropical biology and the biologists who work in the tropics are working in places where you have the most extreme income inequality in the world and all that accompanies that. Um, working in uh, places where uh, government institutions are weak and uh, democracies, if they exist, are often fragile. We have ATBC members in Sri Lanka who a week ago had a completely different life than they did today because, um, you know, four days ago, uh, crowds stormed the presidential and prime ministerial residencies and their leadership nationally has left the country. So they're dealing with that on top of trying to be biologists as well. Um, the places where tropical biologists work are among the most challenging for logistical and political and economic reasons, but they're also amongst the most dangerous, both for individuals professionally who suffer consequences for putting forward uh, perspectives that might be unpopular, and to the journalists and activists that we work with and rely on to get the word out and to help preserve the places where we work, right? So tropical countries are the place, I mean, environmental journalism is one of the most dangerous things you can do as a journalist, and it's in the tropics where people face the greatest risks. All of this is in a climate of financial volatility and uncertainty, if not cutting budgets. In Brazil, the budgets allocated for science and technology by the federal government have plunged 64% um, in recent years. Um, the places where people working in the tropics work are being destroyed in front of us. Um, we think a lot about illegal activity like logging and mining and things like that, but it's also the governments that are put in place to protect those areas. Federal protected area uh, by hectares in Brazil, and Rico Bernard did a really great analysis back in 2014, the areas downsized and degazetted by the federal government have gone from essentially zero through 2001 to 3,500,000 hectares between roughly 2004 and 2011. I wrote Enrico the other day and asked him if he'd had, um, if he'd updated this with the current presidential administration. He said he, he, he just didn't have the heart to do it. But I will point out that the big spike in degazetting of federal protected areas is by the candidate that we're all hoping well, at least I'm hoping, will win the upcoming presidential election, right? So it's complicated. It's not always as straightforward. All of this difficulty is while also trying to write and do science in a language that you often didn't grow up speaking, in a world where research has demonstrated that um, there's a bias in terms of cite citing authors from countries, say in Latin America or in the Global South, where open access fees, if you want to publish your journal in an op open access outlet, are often three to four times what a graduate student makes in a month for an individual article. Um, I noticed um, one of the lead authors here, Leandra, of uh, this paper we just published recently, and we actually showed for the first time that there is a decrease in the diversity of um, national authors represented in open access journals that charge um, article processing charges because the authors just, you just can't afford it. It's a great paper. I highly recommend looking at it there. Um, and it all comes back down to this, this, this notion um, on top of this that editors might, after all of this work that you're doing, tell you, you know what, this is, too, this is for a specialized journal. We, we, we publish broad biology here, not specialized biology, even though you're working in a place that's representative of most of the world's biodiversity and will soon have half of the world's people in it. While the world is collapsing around you because those tropical forests are being cleared and the responsibility is being put on the people in tropical countries to actually save the world from itself, right? It's a really unfair and overwhelming burden, I think, for a lot of biologists. And so after putting this together for, like, for a couple of days, I was like, God, this, this sounds awful, right? And so I was trying to end on an optimistic note because originally this was the end of the talk and I was like, I just cannot go out like that, right? So I tried to piece together a few things to try to think about going forward. Now, Dan Jensen in another article called Wither Tropical Biology once wrote that there are very few things as pretentious as a US scientist 
trying to predict the future of the tropics. And that was great, because I'd just written like four predictions. So I deleted all those, and instead I'm going with this here. I think the first thing we have to do is reshape and take back the narrative. I love this map. There is no earthly reason why the map we look at is the way it is. We could turn the map any way you want, right? And this is what we want to do. We want to reorient people's perceptions about what the tropic is, the tropics are, and what tropical biology is, right? We want to move from this notion that the temperate biology is our baseline biology and tropical biology is the fine tuning of that. And we're not going to be obnoxious about it and just flip these circles, but and we really should take this broader, more holistic approach in which not only do we think about the relationship between biology in different places, but we do tie people to place. I think it's not a bad thing that we think about place when we do our research, right? One could argue the world would benefit a lot if you know, those broader global journals, which we all seek to publish in, which lots of us are editors for, we've done work with, also encourage people to think about place. I think we need to make sure that people cite with purpose, right? Citation is a political act. Who you cite is important. There's very clear evidence that citation leads, um, that if you have more countries represented on your author list, you get cited more. There are biases in citation rate, which we lay out in this article here by Smith et al. We reviewed a million articles, showed the way in which national biases exist in citation. Cite with purpose. It's, it's political when you cite. Cite voices and people that you want elevated. Teach with purpose. Elevate the research and biographies of scientists based in the tropics. Anybody know who this is? It's Emily Snethledge, who was wandering around the Amazon. Um, uh, she's a remarkable story. She, um, was, she's a birder. She worked at the Geldi Museum. She once amputated her own finger because she was getting gangrene, and none of her materos would amputate it for her with a machete. So she did it herself. I thought I saw Yadvinder in here somewhere, right? Yeah, you're a kid. You know, I don't know a single commander of the British Empire would chop off their own finger in the field, right? Yeah, Emily Snethledge did. We should talk about people like her more. Collaborate with purpose. Multinational co-authorship really pays off, but co-authorship is not necessarily collaboration. Collaborate with purpose, collaborate um, properly, and I can get into this afterwards if people have a question, but you need to collaborate not just amongst yourselves, but we should really start to fill in those gaps in collaboration between that bright circle that represents South America and Africa. Right? Um, we need to collaborate, and not just collaborate, but when we do go work in different places, make sure we're collaborating with people there. This is from our article in 2008 in Biotropica. 45% of the articles that we reviewed in Biotropica and Tropical, the Journal of Tropical Ecology, had no collaborators no co-authors from the country where the research was being done. So you've got to make sure you do that right. And doing that right means doing it right. I love this absolutely awful stock photo called multi-ethnic team indoors that I found because it is a great example of how not to collaborate right, right? I can't imagine a worse stock photo if what you're trying to show is the benefits of informational diversity because of course we have the dude up in front, um, we, you know, uh, we have it, and then it gets progressively work to the point where I can't even see the, like, just, it's just great. It's just a phenomenal picture. Don't do that. Collaborate right, collaborate with purpose. Expect change and make change. Um, the way we practice what we do. Over 70% of the editors come from four places. The geographic uh, distribution of editors in our field is deplorable. There are more editors from Sweden, New Zealand, and the Netherlands in our database of editors in our field than there are from Brazil, Mexico, or China, right? Countries with massive and highly productive scientific communities. This just isn't right. We should practice what we preach. Um, it's not enough to point out these issues. You've got to get in the game, support societies in their journals, join committees, run for office, organize reading groups, Wikipedia hackathon, start a local student chapter, organize an ATBC activity or speaker, we'll help you pay for it, right? Read the bylaws of our society, they'll tell you how to get a an item on our meeting's agenda if you really aren't getting the satisfaction you think you deserve. Find new ways to leverage public passion. The thing that got my undergraduate students in my tropical biology class the most freaked out about the tropics was when they realized that only three countries in the world produce most of our chocolate. Suddenly they were all in when it came to preventing deforestation. There are almost 30 teams in the United States in football at universities named for tropical animals like big cats. None of them provide conservation support for any of these species. I kid you not, the University of California at Irvine is the fighting anteaters 
why are they not supporting anteater conservation is beyond me. We need to reach out in new and different and creative ways. That includes to these kinds of companies as well, all of whom are named for tropical organisms or taxa. And this one here, which was actually in an interview, Jeff Bezos said, I named my company Amazon because I wanted it to be the biggest and the best. We need to reach out in different ways. Balenciaga would not charge you $7,000 for that outfit if instead of a black jaguar on it, it had a squirrel. I guarantee it, okay? This is what we need to be doing. And finally, and I'll end with this, congratulate each other. Um, this is the last slide, so when you're done, please do congratulate each other. It takes really a lot of hard work and resilience to do this, but it really matters. I'd like to end with this from Kofi Annan, who has more science papers than I do, um, which is um, that he wrote, 95% of the new science in the world is created by countries comprising only one-fifth of the world's population, and much of that science in the realm of health, for example, neglects problems that afflict most of the world's people. This unbalanced distribution of scientific activity generates serious problems not only for communities in the developing countries, but for development itself. It accelerates the disparity between advanced and developing countries. Kofi Annan makes this argument in this essay that the practice of doing science, doesn't matter what you study, bugs, the you know, phylogeny of clams, deforestation, fires, concert, it doesn't matter. The act of doing research and everything that goes with it actually advances the socioeconomic status of the countries in which it's done. Keep doing research. Don't feel you have to justify that you're doing the, I don't know, the taxonomy of tachinids or, you know, the plant animal interactions between heliconia and the bugs that eat it. It's valuable simply because it makes the country in which you're working better. It advances the condition of the people living there. And that means that every single person in this room is doing something vitally important for the tropical world. And with that, we're out of time, and so I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your attention. I know people have to get out to go to other things. Lucy's got something to say. I've been desperately afraid that John Turbord is going to ask me a question. So, John, if you have a question, I, you know, this, this is the moment. I'll, I'll, I'll take it outside if we, if we don't have time. I promise you can, yeah, you, you can go at it later. Well, first I'd like to start by congratulating Emilio for this absolutely fantastic talk. He brought so many issues that are so crucial to advance science, to advance tropical biology and conservation, and just phenomenal. And in fact, when he mentioned opportunities to contribute to the association, please walk around. There's a bunch of flip charts in different parts of the conference center. We are working on our strategic plan. So please add your comments, because this will define the future of our activities during the next five years. This is really your association. We really would like your feedback. So please take time to do that. And I also would like to take this opportunity to recognize Emilio's contributions for the association. So Emilio has served as editor-in-chief of Biotropica, has been a counselor for several years, has served on numerous committees of the ATBC. And right now, Emilio is, has served as president last year. Right now, he is past president. And even though his term as past president ends in December, I wanted to take this opportunity that we are all here together to really recognize Emilio's uh, contributions. Thank you so much, Emilio, for everything you've done for the ATBC. I think there's something, I don't know if there's something in here afterwards or not. I, like I said, I will rant all day about just about anything, even something I know something about. So if people have questions, I'm happy to take them. I will, I wish I, I had time to put in the slide about that. This is, by the way, be proud of the institutions in the tropics. This is one of the 47 slides I had to cut out. Um, I want to point this out because wine is here because of our sponsoring institution here has been so supportive. Um, I was really impressed when Juan mentioned that the Universidad del Rosario 
was founded in 1653. And then I was like, dude, that's not even the top 15 in Latin America. What are you talking about? Like, this is an incredibly rich intellectual history in this country. The first journals in the Americas were published here in 1818, right? Um, um, in uh, 1885, the institutions, our Kiri institutions were here before they were anywhere else. People in this room should walk around like, I mean, you should be flexing all day long. It's unreal. We should be really proud of ourselves. Juan, thanks a lot, especially to the university. They, they have just wonderful partners. And, um, you know, I will tell you that Harvard, although it was officially founded in 1636, they were only incorporated in 1658. So you're ahead of Harvard, too. Thank you very much, Emilio, for your great talk. Now we're open for questions. We have time for one or two. Oh, I knew it. God, I should have said that thing about <laughs> Sorry, right, I'll get back, to you. Uh, I'll get back to you later. But uh, uh, fascinating talk, really interesting. Uh, over the last decade or two, you know, we've got used to not using the highly inappropriate term developing countries and using the global south yep. as a term. And from based on what you're saying, is the global tropics a much better term? Global south is a problem as well. What about Australia and things? Is global tropics a better concept than global south? Or yeah. is it actually still othering the tropics and actually enhances yeah, the problem? Global tropics might be m more appropriate. I, I don't think, I think most people who think, so there is no perfect term that's part of the problem. But I think a lot of the people I've had interactions with who find the term global south most problematic haven't actually read the report that generated that you know, from whence that term came, all of which explains, you know, it's about the flow of commerce and economic power. It, it's a, you know, the term Global South reflects the colonial and economic history. It's not just geography. And so global tropics might be really reasonable, although, of course, that excludes a lot of the Southern Cone and other places, you know, uh, you know as well. So I, I, I don't think there is a perfect term, and this is one of those arguments where um, you can, no matter what term you use, you might make 80% of the people happy and 20% will be your reviewers. And so um, I'm not sure what the solution is. I, I really do want to emphasize, though, that I don't think it's a bad adjective, right? People, people really are passionate about this adjective, and they have been for a long time. This painting by Church in 1859 13,000 people filed by this painting. They paid a quarter each in the 1850s to file by this painting called The Heart of the Andes and look at it for a moment in a museum. There were lines around the block. People are fascinated by these systems, so why on earth would we do away with this term? I think we need to play on it, whether we use it as a unifying theme for how we think about socioeconomic development or as a rallying cry for conservation or, you know, code switch and use it when we need to, I'm not really sure. But there's no way we should be getting rid of this adjective anytime soon. Does anybody else have a question? Please. Oh, where's Marielos? Hola, Marielos. Oh, yep. I've heard you yell, Maria Los. I can hear you from here. <laughs> so thank you, Emilio, for the fascinating. No, that's not Maria Los. Yeah. Maria Los the <laughs> if Maria Los has a question, she gets to go first, just because yeah. you grabbed the mic. If it's if it's Lawrence who has a question, that's fine. But I heard Maria Los, and that's like seriously, dude. Come on, we just had to talk about colonialism. <laughs> I'm just a servant, both at home and Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, so I had, this, as a student, the choice to go to a boring Dutch beach forest or a fascinating tropical forest. So I went to this fascinating tropical forest, and I lived in this small town called Riberalta, which is in the periphery of where you can think, uh, where you can be in Bolivia. So I had the feeling I was at the end of the world. Others said you're at the beginning of the world. That's where it starts. Uh, but I realized that living in Riberalta, it's, you're very far away from Santa Cruz, uh, and there have the people feel that they are marginalized because the center of the power is in La Paz. So for me, this whole story you tell, this is a story about center versus periphery. Uh, so what could be the role of global leaders in the South, like uh, Brazil, like Mexico, uh, leading institutes uh, like the UNAM, uh, like the USP, in uh, democratic, making science more democratic also within their countries and connecting, for example, to Africa? Um, yeah, that, that's a really important point. Actually, in this paper by Stocks et al., we, when we reviewed the work, there's a clean distinction in the way that countries operate. It's the one that g gave this result here. Um, 
Brazil and Mexico actually are the ones where most of the work being done in that country is being led by scientists from that country. Um, you know, Costa Rica, Panama, those are some of the ones where it's people from outside coming in. So I think leading by example is a really good idea, right? One of the, Brazil is a highly productive scientific community that in many cases doesn't, you know, it doesn't need to go outside, right? Um, but I do think that there is a way for people to do this. Let me see if I can pull that map up. That, that is what they can do. If you notice, there's one of the things about, for instance, Brazil, which is one of the case studies that I've studied, um, Brazil has very little collaboration in-house across institutions. Most of the collaborations there are between that Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Minas Gerais section, and outside to Europe or the United States. There's a lot, a lot less productive collaboration with other institutions in Brazil and almost none across the tropical south right, the global tropics. And so I think that in many cases, uh, scientists in this country are doing exactly the right thing. They're creating great graduate programs, doing great research, it's cutting edge, they're sending it off to the best journals possible, but then acting as leaders means looking to collaborate and capacity build across the South instead of internally um, via collaborations externally with the global North. That, that, that's the missing piece right there. For me, there are no, this isn't actually a map, right? Each point represents a co-authorship location. It's done by someone else. It's a great map. But there are no lines defining political boundaries in this map. And there, it's, you can see individual places, but there aren't a lot of lights in, in a place where there is a lot of land, there are a lot of people, and there are a lot of universities. And that, that's unacceptable. All right. Uh Emilio, I'm not, I'm oh, not, I'm yes. not going to throw Do it, John. Ball. Bring it. There's a, there's a dimension of this that, that deserves mention, though. I'm, I'm an, uh, an old-timer who's seen a lot and, and uh, started in my tropical biology career back in the early 1960s. And uh, as you know, I was in Peru practically uh, all that time. But when I started in Peru, there was no PhD program in the country. The professors in the universities there had bachelor's degree only, or maybe a, a sort of licenciatura, which is a little beyond that. And uh, there was no career path in biology. It, there was nothing happening. There was no future. There were no possibilities for students. And uh, um, a lot has changed. Um, and it changed enormously. And uh, now there are scores of, of Peruvian PhD biologists, a lot of them are scattered all over the world, some of them in this room, and uh, that makes collaboration so much more natural and, and satisfying. It, the, the intellectual level between um, people from US, Europe, and, and their southern counterparts mm -hmm. is, is on a level plane now. It was never that before. So, I think things have improved hugely in, in the, over my lifetime. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad to hear that. And I think, John, one of, the, one of the things that stands out is in a lot of places, individuals play a really key role, right? So, you know, in Mexico, a lot of us would probably point to the arrival of the return of Jose Sarucan from Wales as being a really key moment in the development of ecology in Mexico, for instance, right? Or the arrival of someone who commits to a lifetime of working in Peru and training students and bringing people along, that's really great. I can't emphasize enough how much that those interactions pay off. One of the things I didn't show in this literature review is I actually went and looked to see when someone based in a different country appeared for the first time in the journal Ecology, for instance. Um, you know, Ecology has been publishing since the early 1900s. Um, there was an American who fought, uh, that's why I mentioned to Kinnids, he, he was an, a, a taxonomist who fought with all the taxonomists here and he left the country. He was kind of a vagabond, really interesting character. He left and he happened to publish two papers when he was in Brazil before he moved off to another country. So he appeared there. But in the journal Ecology, not that there weren't Brazilians, they may have been at outside in, in, out, uh, institutions outside the country, but there wasn't a paper with a Brazilian address on it, you know, primary address until the 1980s, at which time there were two throughout the entire decade. People based at a Brazilian institution with a paper in ecology. A couple of those were actually expats who moved there. In the 1990s, the entire decade, there were a total of nine papers with a Brazilian author home address on them in the journal Ecology. There are people in this room who've published, like, 
you know, you had vendors publish like nine papers in ecology like in the last 20 minutes, right? And so this, this is, think about what this means to the intellectual development, the very thing you're talking about. You, you know, people in my lab or Yad Vinder's lab can turn around and get advice on how to submit a paper to one of these journals or how to write a paper for one of these journals from the person in the next, next desk or next office or down the hall. Uh, you know, for an, an entire, I mean, if you were in a country like this for an entire decade, there was no one in the country you could turn to to get some basics about like, hey, easily, what do you think? Do you think this would be good for ecology? And so when you, you, you jumpstart that, of course, Brazil is now up to 20 in a year, you, you, you jump start, and that's the hard part, is finding how you go from where you started to what you see now. Um, and I, I put weight on individuals. Individuals, I think, are far more powerful than they think, despite what feels like just the overwhelming pressure of everything that's going on around us. You can start small, sight well, and, um, you know, sight, sight with, you know, purpose, and teach with purpose, and I think that's really a great way to get started. And I, I see Juan needs to get us rolling, so. Yep, and I shouldn't just say Juan. Our organizers need to get us started. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for your participation, and please enjoy the rest of your day.